Hello everyone and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your host and comrade Max Wilbert. For this episode of The Green Flame, I interviewed Fred Gibson, co-founder of Communities That Protect and Resist, CPR. The interview is followed by a brief discussion inspired by the work of CPR. We wish to thank our in-house improvisational piano soloist and the melodious voices of Grasslands for accompanying us in this episode. Thank you for joining us. Fred, thank you so much for joining us here on The Green Flame. Could you take a minute or two to introduce yourself to our listeners? Absolutely, Jennifer. And uh, thanks again for having me on The Green Flame. I'm uh, really pleased to be here and to have a chance to speak. I'm Fred Gibson. As uh, some of you may know, I'm co-founder of Communities That Protect and Resist, also known as uh, CPR. I do want to acknowledge up front that I am talking from occupied territory of the Ute Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes, among others. And it's important for us to keep that in mind, particularly as we're talking about communities and as we're thinking about taking lessons from indigenous communities, we need to keep that uh, in our minds. I've been an activist about eight years now in the social justice and ecological justice arenas. Uh, and I think I'm still sharpening my skills and my analysis as I go on, but I have a couple of years under my belt anyway. By training, I'm an organizational psychologist and what I've been trying to do the past few years is to use that knowledge and skills and, and frames and so on to help communities and help uh, people in the activist community. Finally, I guess, and by way of introduction, I have about 25 years of military experience. I have a, I've been a leadership practitioner, a leadership scholar, a leadership coach, a leadership trainer, and a leadership educator. So I've done a, a number of things over the years in terms of the leadership arena. And again, I'm happy to share whatever skills I can in that regard. Please, Fred, could you explain communities that protect and resist? um, What is that? What is this new organization? Sure. Um, Communities that protect and resist, basically, and and what I'm doing is kind of telling you what our mission statement is. But as of right now, we're a coalition of and for communities that work together, hopefully down the road, to build and protect just living communities that actively and directly resist the destructive forces uh, in our planet, including things like patriarchy and misogyny, capitalism, racism, militarism, environmental destruction. And the way that we do that, at least the way that we're currently organized is we're a support group, we're a clearinghouse, we're a resource bank and a facilitator for activists who want to build strong communities to do those sorts of things and to leverage them to pursue that just and sustainable future. Uh, That will perhaps grow down the road, but that's the way that we're uh, hoping to pursue our our mission at this point. Right now, we have an active staff of about five volunteers, and we'll see how that goes down the road. We'll talk about that later, I think, as we talk about our plans for the future. What inspired the creation of CPR? Well, it's become obvious, I think, to me, and I don't think I'm missing the boat when I say that I think the missing link between large-scale resistance movements and small small bands of activists who are trying to protect the planet is this notion of of communities. And I'll expand on that in, in just a minute. But you've heard me speak before, Jennifer, and other people have too, that leadership is important in, in the resistance movement. We're really getting our butts kicked. Uh, we have problems not just with the threats to the environment and, and the planet, but we have internal problems with respect to turnover and commitment. And so we're not all doing as much and as well as we could do. And I think leadership is one of the ways that we can leverage our talents and the talents of our comrades more effectively. The other thing is that neoliberalism in the past several decades have really atomized society. And and we haven't been as effective as we can be because we tend to be forced into these very small units. For example, the nuclear family, 
And so I guess when you talk about atomization of society and nuclear family, there's some sort of unintended irony there. But uh, what we need are people who can build and cultivate communities. And why? Because, uh, first of all, communities, I think, are a fundamental unit of opposition. And then secondly, uh, down the road, after what many of us view as inevitable collapse, they're going to serve as viable alternative cultures to down the road. Um, I think of uh, Vincent Emanuel's notion. He talked about the fact that if you think your, you know, your, bu your bunkers and your arms and so on, uh, if you isolate yourself out in the woods or up in the mountains and so on, is it's going to save you after collapse, you're, you're mistaken. The only thing that's really going to protect us down the road is some sort of a strong community. So that's the kind of thing that we're committed to. Even then, just building a community isn't enough. We have to build, and we're committed in CPR to building oppositional communities, uh, communities that actually oppose the dominant culture. That may seem like that's something weird or, or new or counterintuitive, but in fact, there's a fair amount of history to oppositional communities. As we know it, the oppositional community started way back in the early 20th century uh, in what some people call a progressive era in the settlement houses. And, and interestingly, if you think about what the settlement houses did, they talked about a rejection of individual causes of poverty. They advocated cross-class solidarity and willingness to organize and advocate for justice. And so you, that carries all the way up through Saul Alinsky and his uh, Chicago organizing and even into the 60s and the oppositional communities that, that took place then. So there actually is a fair amount of history to oppositional communities. Um, this is fascinating, Fred. Could you go ahead and tell us more about oppositional community? Absolutely. You know, you know the opposition isn't as, as radical as it needs to be, I think. We need to do more in that regard. And that more happens to be that we need communities who are willing to actually dismantle the dominant culture, not, not just oppose, not just escape, um, but to actually take on a more radical orientation. And so what we do is to take on this notion we've developed in, in our analysis, what we think makes for a radical community. In our view, in our analysis, a radical community is radical for two reasons, for its purpose and for its practices. And the purpose we already talked about, okay, a radical community in a sense, is one that, that opposes and tries to dismantle the dominant culture. But another way to distinguish a radical community is not just what it does uh, in terms of its external focus, but sometimes its internal focus. And so one of the ways we do that is to reject patriarchy, the root cause of much of the toxicity in our dominant culture. And instead, what we're hoping to do is to introduce or to practice a more matriarchal orientation uh, as much as we're able to do that. We're still exploring what that would look like, and we're looking for lots of uh, inputs and lots of perspectives from others about that sort of notion. One of the other ways that we do that, I think, is to acknowledge and to uh, honor and to incorporate indigenous principles into our organizing. And then finally, uh, one of the ways that we, we do things differently in a CPR collective is that we think our collectives consist of five components, comradeship, consciousness, commitment, shared power, and leadership. And while those terms on, on their face don't necessarily denote a radical orientation, our notion of those takes on a more systemic view. And for our listeners who want to know more, you'll have to read the book. Um, and so I'm just joking, by the way. If you want to know more, we'd be happy to have more conversations with you. And our blog page and our Facebook page have more information in that regard. So thanks for that question, Jennifer, and I hope it didn't take too long to answer it. That was fascinating. I want to focus now specifically on the leadership element. That's something that I believe you have extensive training in. And I'm wondering how that fuels CPR's fire in particular. Okay. I, I kind of previewed that a little bit already. You know, there's a couple of ways that I think leadership plays a role. And one is the mainstream notion of leadership as inspiring. One of the models that we adopt from Kuzis and Posner is that leadership is the art and practice of inspiring a group to pursue a, and advocate for a shared purpose and a shared vision. And that gets back to the notion that you know, we don't have large numbers of people in the resistance movement. So we need to leverage them as much as we're absolutely able to. And as uh, John Cotter says, you're not going to be able to manage people into battle you're going to have to lead them there. And so we, what we do is we emphasize 
the importance of leadership in a CPR collective and in resistance in general. But leadership is also particularly critical, I think, at the community level. And what we're finding is that there seem to be qualitative differences in leadership for communities as opposed to leadership in teams and mainstream organizations and so on. And if you'll um, indulge me for just a second, I have a, a quick story. Uh, about uh, four years ago or so, I was out in Southern Nevada with a number of other activists uh, looking at the damage and advocating uh, to save the pinyon juniper forest out there. And I had the opportunity to spend a couple of days with an elder member of the Western Shoshone tribe. And uh, the word was uh, that th this uh, person who came to join us was a chief of his tribe. And so while we were out looking at the, the ecological damage, I, I asked him uh, if he was indeed chief of his tribe. Well, he didn't answer for a few moments and he just kind of smiled and said, that's a big word. And to me, nothing better exemplifies the challenges of community leadership than the fact that this is a big word. This is a big responsibility. In fact, there are qualitative differences between communities and, and other organizations that we need to be mindful of. And one of those is this notion that whatever gains you make sometimes in organizing can be pretty ephemeral. They can be lost really easily through a number of external threats, many of which we know about, and some internal as well. And one of those is this notion of, of drift. And it's pretty much the case, I dare I say axiomatic, that over time, groups of people drift in a number of ways. Uh, one is that individuals within a group tend to drift off in their own direction, in their own vision, in their own paths. And that's one way that we kind of dilute the strength of groups. Another is that uh, even an intact community that's pretty, pretty um, close-knit can drift off from their initial purpose or their initial vision for what they need to be doing. And then finally, uh, individuals, organizations, and communities sometimes just lose steam. It's this notion, I think, of community entropy uh, that we need to be mindful of. And so community leaders need to have the wisdom, I think, and the, uh, the frames and the skills and so on to, to fight all of these threats to the community as, as we know it. So we need to be able to have leaders who can fight the tendency for communities to scatter, disperse, and drift, and so on. And so one of the ways that we do that is to take whatever lessons we can from uh, indigenous communities. I don't want to appropriate too much of, of that culture, but some of the things that we're finding, and we can expand on this uh, another time perhaps, is one of the things we're finding as we, as we read about and talk to indigenous community leaders is they're characterized by an abiding sense of place, um, by a sense of the interconnection um, among all the beings and, and members in their land base and community, their emphasis on narrative and story and, and maintaining a strong culture, and then an, uh, also a recognition and an emphasis on the role that spirituality can play as leaders and in their respective communities. And so as we engage in our development work and, and networking and so on, we'd like to incorporate some of those very important lessons that we're seeing and hearing from indigenous folk. It sounds very much like CPR is taking a deep look at every aspect of community building. In addition to that deep look and deep analysis and continued investigation and listening, what are you doing in CPR? What projects are you currently involved in? Well, we do have a few initiatives that are priorities for us right now. And, and again, you know, we are at least at the moment a little bit limited in terms of uh, our staff, but we have about four things that we're, we're hoping to accomplish right now or in the very near future. And the first thing is to develop what you might call our analysis or our conceptual infrastructure. And amazingly, uh, that stage is pretty much complete. When we talk about things like comradeship and consciousness and commitment and shared power and leadership as, as the essential characteristics of a strong CPR collective, that's our foundational view of what we can do to build those sorts of communities. So that first stage, I think, is complete. And, and we can leverage that in a lot of different ways, which I'll get to in just a moment. Congratulations. That's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I have to say that uh, one of the ways that you 
can really get things done is to have people set a deadline for you. And we were very fortunate to have some people ask for this sort of uh, information. And uh, we'll talk about that more in just a moment. But thanks to everybody out there who asked for information about CPR collectives because you made us get this done. Yay. I know. Um, second thing we're talking about is growing our organization and growing our network. But as uh, some wise counselors in CPR have mentioned, this is the kind of thing I think that needs to occur organically. So uh, what we're hoping to do is to, to build an infrastructure, to, to build an analysis, to, um, to build a set of concepts and build a vision for community that people want to be part of. And that if, if that's the case, uh, that people will begin to join up with that and, and see the value in it. And so we have our fingers crossed that we're putting things together that are valuable and that people will think are valuable and want to be part of. And I will get to that pretty shortly, but we do or we are starting to see some evidence of the fact that uh, people want to be part of not necessarily CPR, but the things that we represent and the things that we can offer. So that's good news as well, I think. The third thing is training activists and, and training cadre. Um, and in fact, we already have two training programs that are out there. The one that we have already offered for a couple of years now is Leadership for Resistance. And we have had three or four cohorts go through that training course. Secondly, we have uh, what's called Leading Communities of Resistance that we uh, had on the shelf for uh, about an hour. And some people from the Asia Pacific Ecological Network asked for some training. And we said, you know, that sounds like something we could we already have that we can offer for you. And it turned out that it's a good fit. Interestingly, we're going to start our first cohort a week from tonight. And we have about uh, 15 people signed up from um, several different continents. So we're very happy about that. And not only for the opportunity to train, but for the fact that these folks can now serve down the road as cadre. And we'd like to view it as a train the trainer program where those cadre will go out and train other people and how to organize a radical community. And then finally, knock on wood, uh, we're hoping to take our stuff on the road and to help communities that are uh, looking to build, looking to organize, looking to create communities and collectives that are gonna resist the dominant culture. And we're going to see how we can make that happen uh, very quickly. So the COVID situation this year has um, stalled some of the plans for the future that you have, it sounds like, that you're talking about taking things on the road. And that would be difficult under current conditions, but possible in the future. What other plans do you have for the future? Well, Jennifer, you, were, you said that uh, in a very nice way. I can just say that uh, 2020 was not kind to our strategic plan. And uh, as uh, the philosopher Mike Tyson has said, everybody's got a plan until they got punched in the face. And <laughs> so, nice quote. <laughs> I know. Um, so yeah, 2020 kind of punched us in the face a bit. Uh, and, and, but we still have a plan that we think is viable, and we're hoping that 2021 will be kinder to us and to everybody else, and so that we can really start to build some momentum for what we're trying to do. And um, not to be too mechanistic about it, but uh, we're looking at areas like outreach and propaganda, asset sharing, uh, are having a course sequence of, of training for people who want to be leaders and then developing a kind of a stable of other skills courses as well. Uh, and also to help people change the culture where they can through things like survey work, uh, social norms, marketing uh, interventions and podcasts and so on. So we have a number of things that we would like to do. And we have, I think, some of the expertise to do that. But uh, maybe next year will allow us to be out and about with some folks and actually do some face-to-face -face training and community building. That sounds wonderful. How can we contact you to keep current on what CPR is doing and, and will be doing in the future? Well, thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> one of the things you can do is to get on Facebook and look at or look up communities that protect and resist. We have a Facebook page. If you want to look at our actual blog page, that is uh, lowercase c t p r dot home dot blog, and then finally, if you want to email us, we are at c t p r at proton mail. Uh, we're recording on the thirteenth, on Friday, the thirteenth of November, and you said that a week from tonight is when the the community training begins. Is it too late for people to look into applying to become part of that training? 
Oh, excellent question. Uh, it is not too late. The good news is that we still have uh, some slots available. And it's not like there's going to be a lot of readings that people have to go down to the, you know, the bookstore and get a bunch of textbooks and read the first eight chapters before class starts. Uh, we're not doing that. So if people want to try to sign up before a week from the 13th, then we'd be happy to talk with them. And um, if they would go to our blog page or go to the Facebook page and spend some time to fill out the app, uh, the chances are pretty good that they'll be uh, accepted. Well, speaking of Elcor, as I like to call it, or leading communities of resistance, one of the things we were very excited about is that we have two cohorts that are set up for next week's start. We have a North American cohort, and we have uh, what loosely is called an Asia-Pacific cohort. Although, uh, in addition to people from North America, we have um, participants from Sweden, from Ireland, from Nepal, from New Zealand, from the archipelago, and and other places. And so we're, we're very excited to build uh, this, what I will humbly call a global network of, of activists who are trying to build resistance communities. And we're, they're doing that around the world. So we're looking forward to that and stand by for more news from the front as we engage in that course. Do you have any final thoughts that you would like to share? Yeah, a couple things, Jennifer, if you, if you don't mind. Um, one is, you know, if we're thinking about or talking about how people can contribute to this effort, there's a couple of things. And one is share your stories, share your best practices, tell us about your community and how you're organizing because there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Secondly, if you'd like to get involved with uh, CPR, we're always in need of tech skills, including <laughs> social media and IT sorts of skills. And for those of you who have spent any time on our blog page, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Third, if you're interested, as, as Jennifer, as you just mentioned, if you want to sign up for LCOR, as I call it, Leading Communities of Resistance, uh, and or just converse with us about those issues, then build a connection. Uh, and, and then finally, in terms of final, final thoughts, uh, I remember Derek Jensen spoke at, at a conference uh, we were all at, I think, about four years ago or so, and somebody asked him what, what resistance really is going to look like if it's going to be effective down the road. And he said something to the effect, and I hope I'm not misquoting him too badly. What it looks like is a thousand groups, a thousand communities all resisting uh, throughout the planet. And I, I have remembered that, obviously, and, and taken it to heart. And so I, what I remind everybody about is if we're going to succeed in dismantling industrial civilization, we're going to need CPR sorts of collectives to do it. So I would urge everybody to build yours and if you want to join with us and network with us in that endeavor, we would love to be doing that with you. Thank you. That's a delightful invitation. And I'm so happy that we had the chance to focus on CPR and to listen to one of the founders talk about this exciting new adventure. Jennifer, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you, and I'm honored to have a chance to get the word out there. I want to take a moment and invite you to a special event that's taking place on November 22nd. It's called Drawing the Line, Stopping the Murder of the Planet, and it's a special four-hour live stream featuring Derek Jensen, Lear Keith, Deep Green Resistance organizers from around the world, and special guests. The event begins at 1 p.m. Pacific time and is hosted by Deep Green Resistance. We will introduce you to on-the-ground organizing campaigns being waged around the planet, introduce various strategies for effective organizing, rebut false solutions through readings of the forthcoming book Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It, and we will discuss the philosophy of resistance. There will be opportunities to ask questions and to participate in dialogue during the event. This event is also a fundraiser. The mainstream environmental movement is funded mainly by foundations which don't want foundational or revolutionary change. Radical organizations like Deep Green Resistance therefore rely on individual small donations to support our activism around the world. We're trying to raise funds to support global community organizing via our chapters, fund mutual aid and direct action campaigns, 
and make our core outreach and organizational work possible. Whether or not you are in a financial position to donate, we hope you will join us on November 22nd for this event. For more details, please check out the Deep Green Resistance News Service or our Facebook page. Yeah, I'm still kind of mulling over the the depth of what you're after here. It's a it's a step beyond resisting into dismantling. That's an enormous jump because I, I just I'm just thinking about all the cultures that have been mowed down by civilization. Right. And they resisted like hell. And and you know it's just been cutting us, <laughs> cutting cutting cultures and and everything down in its wake. To turn it around and be able to dismantle it, is is a is, it, that's a very that's a very unique undertaking. Yeah, perhaps, but I guess you know my perspective is I don't see any other way to do it, right? So, you know, it's not going to be you know, sp- small bands of, uh, you know, activists turning valves and so on. And we're never going to get the large scale movement that we would need to do things a- another way, like through, you know, nonviolent direct action or whatever. So I think communities are really the only viable unit of resistance uh, that we have. And absolutely, I mean, you know, as you know, even better than I, countless cultures have been destroyed and, and forgotten, right? Um, and And so, you know, I guess the only thing we can do is to continue to build those sorts of cultures and communities so that when a collapse does occur and we know it's going to, um, that we're going to have communities that are hopefully less patriarchal, uh, more in tune with their environment and their land base and more in tune with a a matriarchal sort of culture and more in tune with an indigenous sort of culture. And so Uh, I think the the best uh, that we can do is to introduce that to as many people as we can and to give them whatever skills we can so that they can begin to do that building work. Right. Maybe there's some unique opportunities as states begin to in- inevitably fail as, you know, civilizations always collapse. The states always fail eventually. Maybe there's yeah. some unique opportunities to once ago, again, go back to small human scale, scale communities in the wake of all of that. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, tough times, but tough times, but the right direction. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that. <sighs> That would work in our favor, I think, right? So, you know, we're not going to have a global military that's able to drop bombs around the world. We're, you know, mm-hmm. these, these battles, so to speak, are going to be fought locally. And that's where local organizing and community building are, are hopefully going to have the advantage. Um, and so I'm not saying I welcome this balkanization, but I think as you, as you do, that it's kind of inevitable, especially, you know, with the peak oil uh, and that sort of thing. And so what we need to do is to have strong communities um, that j- don't just oppose this sort of thing because what you then wind up with is another, another patriarchal clan or society just replacing exactly. the old one, right? Um, so I think it's important for us to focus not just on resistance, but, but building communities that are going to be just and sustainable and, and not patriarchal. Well, I think as inevitable as the failure of the states that serve, serve nothing at the, at the capital at this point, um, the patriarchal structures inevitably fail because they do not sustain life. Yeah, good point. I mean, it's it's the it's the same it's the same scenario. You you know, it can't continue because it sustains no life. It can't continue because it it converts the living to the dead for profit, writ large and writ small. So right, right. You know, the the two fronts are are equally important. It sounds like. Yeah. And hopefully we'll we'll cover both of those sorts of things, you know, in enough depth in the course that people have a, a deep enough understanding of both of those, so that all those kinds of things get incorporated into their their um, strategic plan and, and their uh, vision for themselves down the road. That's you know, and it's it's brilliant that CPR has the vision. That you know, it starts out with the vision. Without vision, without that underlying foundation, you really have no place to stand at all. And I think that's also a huge failing of of communities that really aren't communities. There's no foundation to them. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for listening to our Green Flame podcast. If you have missed the opportunity offered by CPR on this episode to enroll in the first LCOR course, never fear. 
Stay in touch with CPR and watch for future courses, events, and offerings. This is Max Wilbert, one of the hosts of the Green Flame podcast. I want to thank you for listening to our show and let you know a few ways that you can support the Green Flame. First, you can subscribe to our platform using the podcasting system of your choice. We're listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, and all the rest. We're even on YouTube. Leaving us a positive review or rating on these platforms helps us reach a larger audience. You can also share these shows with your friends. If you're interested in donating to support the production of The Green Flame, please visit deepgreenresistance.org. And finally, the goal of this show is to activate people. So if you really want to support this show, start organizing in your own community. Thank you again for listening.